We Share Radio. Spread the word, spread the word. Connecting the We Share community around the world. We Share Radio. It's actually a tangible way of changing our lives. <laughs> So good morning people, actually good afternoon, I'm, um, this is another earth changing, shattering We Share radio podcast and I'm sat here with Sean, what are you doing this next month? Next month I'm campaigning to be Mayor of London, so that, 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 slightly more than full time. That, that, that trashes my usual opening question which is um, what are you known for, what would you like to be known for? Ah, yeah. okay. Right, well, I'm known for being a green politician, uh, been a green politician for about 12 years, um, currently a councillor in Camden, and I'm a bit of transport campaigner for a long time as well. And I'd like to be known for being the first woman, first green mayor of London. <laughs> Hurrah, and, and, and so, so would I. Um, so we, I, I was trying to think how to do this, and because we, we have to at least attempt to um, remain politically unbiased, but I am a card carrier member the Green Party. So what I did is I asked, I emailed lots of people last night and said, um, "What would you ask the next Mayor of London?" Yeah. And they said, "I thought Boris was standing down." But um, so I'm going to go through this list of things here from different friends around the world. So the first one is from um, Alex Hillman, who's from runs a co-working space called Indie Hall in Philadelphia, and he said, "Besides voting for you." How can Londoners help make help you make London better? Well, that's a that's a really good question. Is it Alex? Thank you, Alex. Um, we are all about in the Greens empowering people. We're about getting ideas up from the grassroots, helping people to help themselves. So one of the policies I'm, I'm putting forward as mayor is to start a London renters' union. Um, the government aren't giving us the powers to control rents, but if we help fund uh, a renters' union to support private renters, then they can use the tools that they have. Um, the existing laws to look after themselves. So there's loads of things coming up um, in the next mayoralty that are really important for the next mayor to do. One is rewrite the London plan. So I would say to anyone who wants to know what you can do to help is get involved in, in rewriting the London plan with me. Uh, we need to rewrite the, the, all the planning rules, the strategy for London for the next 25 years, make a huge difference to how London develops. And it, it affects everything. It affects how homes, green spaces, what spaces we build for new businesses, is how we organise our transport, all of it is going to be in this London plan. How, how, can, how can people get involved in that? Because I'm, I'm, I find it very hard to like, get involved in anything when people said things like that. Yeah, yeah. Really well, the traditional about... route for this is that you know the, the mayor will go away, write it, and then put it out for consultation and ask for comments. And that is not the way to do it, I think. I think we need to be going to local communities and asking people it, the fundamental question, how do you want London to be in the future? And from that, how do you want things to be? What, what rules do you want? You know, what restrictions do you want on new developments? What positive things do you want to put forward in terms of investment and things like that? And really get the answers from the grassroots before you even start to draft it. And that's so. Hopefully, if I was mayor, I'd be organising lots of local meetings, trying to get any local group that you're already involved with or any stakeholder group. I'd be coming to talk to you and saying, "Send us your ideas." I always wonder, is it just a certain type of person that responds to that type of thing? Um, there can be, and that's and again, it's really important that whoever's organising the work that you're doing to, to talk to people is going out and reaching people who won't normally engage. If you just, again, if you just buzz a consultation online and you let the you know the usual groups know, then you'll get responses from the usual groups and you'll get responses from the people who are paying attention to your consultations online, and that'll be it. And your average person in the street, your average young person particularly, who doesn't pay attention to um, you know what's going on in City Hall or what the local council is doing, they, they just won't you won't get their input and so you'll end up with a very biased plan so you've got to go out and reach other groups in other ways and I think things like um, there was a launch yesterday of a talk called Verto or was it yesterday before yesterday by a group called Bite the Ballot who are all about trying to get young people more involved in politics and that's a that's an app you have on your phone where you just answer questions about what um, policies you think you think there should be and it tells you which, which candidate matches you best and explains the voting system and it's just really good that, that was around the general election wasn't it yes that yeah Bite the Ballot are a really really good group oh, I love that there's lots of other groups like that who are doing more to get young people involved in politics and we've got to support them all I was, I was relieved to find out I, was, I, I filled it in and I was scared of filling it in in case I came out as a uh, you know did you get me? Did you get me? I, I haven't done the one for Mayor of London yet. Oh, okay. I, did, I, I did come out as a Green Party thing. But, good, I, good. I, but I still wondered if I was like answering things in that way. There were a couple of things. I'm going to move quickly on to um, Sue Butcher, who's a um, 
and I see it used, used to be a practice manager and architect in Essex, and now she's campaigning for collaboration in the construction industry. Ooh. She went. She was the. She's really lucky. She was the first person. I was. I was the first person she followed on Twitter, and now she has twenty five thousand architects following her. Oh. And I've got like twelve people who work yeah. in social media. So Sue asks. Living in London is so expensive. Do you think the advances in technology and flexible working practices are enough to help the low paid cope, or is there more that should be done? Well, um, no, I mean, there are, it definitely brings opportunities for people to earn um, money in different ways. It's, the flexible working is, I think, is a really, really good thing. I'm going to try and get more employers signed up to flexible working, um, so that's really important. Um, but we've got to be protecting the basic conditions of work. Um, there's a thing, like, so Uber are a good example, actually. They're a, they're a you know... Quite a, that's a key word. Yeah, a key word. Uber. Is that a trigger word? They're, they're quite a you know, they, they, they let you sign on to be a private hire driver, you um, you get given jobs on the app, you work when you want to. That could be a useful way of filling in your income um, if you want to work flexibly. And uh, actually, you know, the way that they work, they recruit so many drivers, they try and drive down how much they pay to drivers, they're constantly changing the terms and conditions, they're not really treating the drivers like workers. In fact, when you talk to them, they won't call them workers at all or employees they were calling them partners and now they're starting to call them customers so you've got to watch out for if you are working you do have rights and you have to be able to stick up for them so we need things like a minimum wage for for London that is the London living wage Um, we need to be making sure that employers who do treat people badly are named and shamed and and that we do more to help people so it's it's not it's not simply leaving it to the the market because in the end the most most powerful people in the market will, will start to you know, yeah. dominate and no, that's that's not no, good for anyone so there's two things one's about Uber and one's about your hair going in your food oh pardon me anyway. sorry I'm eating my dinner at the same time as talking to you so um so yes, things yeah. like Uber they they, they say, what, what, what triggered my question was they could say partners, customers and you know employees so, so what do you what do you think the people driving those cars are in, in your opinion are they are they micro entrepreneurs or independent economic agents or there's, a, there's a whole range of people um, and I've, this is a very naughty question what we do about Uber so I've actually been speaking to like literally everybody on every side of this and one of them is a group of drivers who are organising and they are the ones they are people who've worked in the private hire industry for a while and see the opportunity of working on Uber and getting extra jobs um, but are feeling the fact that, that Uber are starting to squeeze the drivers um, so they're, they're organising with a union um, they're trying to negotiate with Uber um, and they're liaising with other groups as, as well and I think yeah they are they are people who, who want this to be their job for a living I think Uber probably has thousands of other people who do it um, more casually but even so the amount you earn per hour goes down and down and down if they're recruiting more drivers than they have jobs then you wait yeah. around a long time for a job and so when Camden where I'm a councillor there are issues with Uber drivers parking waiting for jobs and in, in theory that should never happen according to Uber's really efficient um, yeah, uh, algorithm you should never wait more than two minutes for a job if you're a driver or a passenger um, but that's actually not true the drivers do spend long periods parked around Kings Cross Station waiting for jobs to come up and that's disruptive so we've got you know, issues there well, what's, what's interesting there is where I live in um, sunny Essex Never wait more than like five minutes for a car, and I think a different different type of I know it's a different type of driver that would be in each place. Because if I was, it's one thing to like circle around Kings Cross Station where there's millions of people getting off, and there's another thing to be uh, waiting to drive baby Bernie to school. And um, not we do that often, viewers. But every time I get in an Uber, I say, "What's this like?" And in two or three years of whatever it is. They always say this is this is way better because I can just you know sit in a cafe, see there's a job, go out and get it. I don't have to like sit in a smoky, stinky thing. And I used to work office. in a in a mini cab office when yeah. I was when I was younger um, in Cheltenham, and it was very smoky and stinky, and you know it was always a you're controlling people by radio, and it's very very inefficient. And the app thing is is absolutely marvellous. So it's got potential. It's just it's just that some of the um, some of the ways that, that Uber organise, they're, they're, they're out to make money, they're, they're very capitalist, and so we have to keep them in check. So I'm going to move seamlessly on to... Uh, you mentioned apps there and how efficient it is, and Antonin from France asks, 
Ask us something. Yes, you wrote this down. Ask us something like, does tech enable a renewed vision for sustainability? I know your source moment. I think it does. I think there's a whole whole load of opportunities there. Um, I mean, Uber's the example of sharing car journeys. That could be a fantastic way of um, making driving and transport around London more efficient if it was people sharing journeys they were making anyway and reducing, you know, filling up cars with more people. Um, you know, it doesn't massively work like that, but it could do. And they've just started Uber Pool, which is a step on the way to that. Can, can, you, um, can you think of another example other than Uber? Oh, right. I'm sure yeah. you can, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, and there's, there's other things like, you know, share um, apps where you might share um, tools, goods. Um, someone I know tried to set up an app where you'd say, look, I've got a lawnmower. Yep. You know, can you borrow my lawnmower? That sort of thing. Um, I think there's lots of ideas out there that London can help with. Um, London, I keep talking about transport because London has, London runs its own transport. That's our major um, sort of power in London is running transport and running, running housing. Um, and it does mean we have a whole load of like, data that we should be sharing. And we have a lo- whole load of information that we can make available for other people to use in entrepreneurial ways to improve sustainability. Um, and one of the things I want to do is set up a solar power company. Um, I want to be getting electricity from community solar projects, putting lots of solar panels onto TFL stuff. I think with that company, you can look at ways of doing smarter grids, um, things like um, putting batteries in people's homes, um, helping people to be more sustainable, but helping people to come up with their own ideas and link up with others and use data that you've made open in the first place. So so you you become mayor, um, is it mayor or mayoress? It's mayor. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was very 21st century of us. So, like, when when you become the uh, the mayor, is that, getting a project like that going is that like a sort of five year thing, or can you do it in the first couple of weeks? <laughs> I mean, it all it all takes time, um, but you do have the power to, you know, create a budget for it, put people onto it, that sort of thing. Um, and it's yeah, it's a powerful job. It's, it's it's funny. It's like a very executive role. You are genuinely managing London um, via the various agencies. So you know, you're in, you're in charge of Transport for London, but somebody else is also the CEO of Transport for London. Yeah. So you work with them very closely. Um, same goes for the police and the fire. Those are the other things you may, mainly control. But also housing. We now give out the housing grants. That the government supply and we can raise some of our own money towards those as well which is another thing I want to do um, but yeah you do have you do have budgets and project money that you can you can put into this sort of thing and it's uh, it's quite exciting I mean I talk about giving London back to Londoners as well and that's the weird thing about this job is that there's it's a very powerful job it's an executive job and it's not really the green way so what you would do with that job is hopefully devolve power to more people draw examples from the grassroots and put those forwards as well you can decide how you make the decisions that, that's one of the most interesting things about the, 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 the green momentum on here is yeah. the uh, trying to develop a horizontal city which is or a horizontally powered city if mm. that way. Sure. Yeah. 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 so giving I mean, giving people a back their voice sounds a bit cheesy but I think people should be more involved in the, I, I would hope that people want to be more involved in their local community rather than just like being drip fed what might happen to them yes. we're very, I feel we're very passive citizens yes we are in London and we shouldn't be because you know we're there's so much scope with a London with a city that's very densely populated where, where if you have an idea probably within five miles of you there are lots of other people who'd be interested in that idea bringing, bringing groups like that together with, with a common interest or bringing people together whose common interest is they, they live in a particular area um, it's all really really important stuff I, I like localism I like, I like the neighbourhood forums that are springing up um, there's two in my council ward and there we're making plans for our very local area you know it's much more fine grained than the London plan. It's it's literally, you know, what kinds of pavement we want and, and what we want to happen to this junction. And that's really, really exciting that actually the process of putting a neighbor plan together empowers people to actually come up with those kinds of ideas. Do you know, do you know Lumio? Lumio? Yeah. No, I do not. I'll, I'll think in the show notes, folks, is that Lumio is how we make decisions in WeShare, which I'm finding amazing. It's like a collaborative decision-making platform. So Bernie will have a great idea, and whereas, you know, even like last year's Bernie would go and say, we're doing this, um, I have to put it up, and I have to bravely put it up, and everyone can comment on it and that kind of thing. So we just did one for a project and it went in a very different direction, but it's, it's liberating. Yes, you don't know what you don't know, do you, until you go and until people bring it to you. Which is really tricky, because I thought I knew everything. So. <laughs> I, mean, I 
I'm sure Boris thinks he knows everything. And this is the thing. We've got to have a different approach. Um, people feel like there's, you know, this is like, the, and this is the, this is the way that the election's going as well. There's a lot of focus on, you know, the two main candidates and who will run London. And I think it shouldn't all be about a person. It should be about an approach. And the Greens have the right approach. Exactly. Um, we're going to be talking about the right approach. Will Chamberlain from Hackney says, is it, we're going to have a direct, dynamic change of direction here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, Sean, what are your plans for food waste, recycling, and how do you say that? And I'm dyslexic, so I can't like, Anaerobic <laughs> digestion. <laughs> Um, strictly, the Mayor of London doesn't doesn't have power over waste. That's all the local councils who run that. And you'll know that if you live in um, one area, if you live in Hackney for a while, or then you, and then you move to Camden, you'll find that your your bins are organised in a completely different way. And that's actually not a good thing. Um, it'd be much better if we had a coordinated waste um, system for London. Um, the Mayor's power over this is is more persuasion, more bringing people together to talk. I'd love to have a common. Um, source of information about where you get your what, what happens with your bins. Um, the mayor can control things like you know do we give incinerators um, planning permission and if we don't things like anaerobic digestion then become much more viable. Um, I think the companies that are out there trying to do incineration are trying to do it for, for financial reasons. You know it's yep. the cheapest thing for them. There are actually financial incentives to burn stuff which is which comes comes down from the government and that's completely crazy why why there financial incentives for burning stuff because you get you get back the land there's a landfill tax on putting things into landfill and then there isn't one on things that you burn even if they're perfectly good things that could be recycled you still save the landfill tax and that's actually there should be less of an there should still be a tax on burning but that incentivises things like anaerobic digestion in favour and there isn't there's the financials push you in that direction but I think People who work for firms like Vividor, who want to build an incinerator in Croydon, um, they're, they're the sort of people, they go to waste management because they're quite interested in doing it well. <laughs> and I think they would be interested in this other stuff if we can um, push it to them and if we can make, make the planning rules such that we're not going to give their incinerators permission, which Boris Johnson doesn't do. So I think we can have an influence in that way. The other thing the mayor can do is use some of the economic development money to pilot new things. So I was speaking to a guy recently who, who wants to use maggots to devour food waste. Um, so this isn't producing gas the way that anaerobic digestion does. What this does is it produces maggots who can then be turned into food for animals because it's protein. Um, not that humans want to eat the maggots. But um, yeah, and that's one, that's another way of turning food waste into something that's useful. Now he wants to, this one wants to pilot this stuff. I think, you know, the mayor could put seed money into piloting things through economic development funds. But we couldn't, we don't have the power to wholesale employ it as the way we do waste because it's the councils yeah, who decide. Like, like the whole Hampstead yeah. Heath would be a maggot farm or something. Like I just, I can't even like hardly say maggots. the word maggots, but I'm sure it's a good idea. <laughs> so there, there you go, Will. And, um, more on that later. So what's, um, After I've had my dinner. Yep. I can't get the word maggot out of my head now. So um, Elena, uh, my buddy, asks, what's more important, jobs or income? And... The question around tech and bullshit jobs, and whether her whether her focus is around making more jobs and making more people have enough to live decently. Well, so I mean, though, you want both those things, don't you? You want minimum standards for jobs. You want to be able to set a living a living wage for London. That's, that's a compulsory minimum wage, um, and you you want to make sure that people, everybody in London isn't made to work all the hours there are for a job that doesn't actually help give them enough to live off. So we've got to be working on all of that. Housing comes into it as well. We've got you know, people paying 60, 70, 80% of their income on their rent. I mean, I'm a private renter as well, and that's that's not good enough. So we have to be building more homes that people can afford to live in as renters and then afford to buy. If you, if you don't mind me asking, why, why, do, you, why do you rent? Because you, do you do have a... A castle in Scotland, or no, no, no. Yeah. I rent. I rent a small flat in London um, because that's what I can afford to do. I've never been able to buy a place because um, I've always worked for like campaign groups and charities and I've had a very big salary, so I've never been able to um, save up enough. I've not had like family money either, so I've never saved up enough for a deposit. And, and the more I wait, the further away it gets. The idea that I might buy someone. That's why I brought my um, luxury Essex apartment because I had to like 
Oh, Get it before I got in any more shit. Yeah, I've left it too late. I definitely have. The house yeah. I used to live in, house, places I used to live in um, Camden, was um, about 20 years ago. It was uh, 110,000, and now a friend of mine sold it a few years ago because he's in real estate for something like 650,000. And at the time, we thought about buying it. We're like, it's four, four lads that live together. And um, probably if we'd stopped going out so much, we would have been able to. <laughs> You see, back in the day, when I first moved to London 20 years ago, um, me and a group of friends, we rented a five-bedroom house in Archway. Yeah. It was entirely affordable. The first first six months I lived in London, I worked as a temp. I didn't have a, a very good job, but I could still afford to rent the big room. 50 quid a week? No, it was no, no, my rent, rent at the time, it was yeah. £100 a week. Yeah. Um, but even so, that was affordable to me. I could earn easily two or £300 a week as a temp. And, yeah, it was it was fine. I had lots of money for going out and all that kind of thing. And now it's really a struggle for people. I mean, people just don't have enough money for, for any kind of going out, any kind of spare money for holidays or clothes and things. A lot of people are struggling really, really badly just to get by day to day, let alone save up for things like a pension or a mortgage. Um, so, has to be dealt with um, and I want to create more jobs I mean we haven't talked about like, small businesses yet and I have to as mad try and generate a more resilient economy where we're not dependent on people like HSBC threatening to leave and take away their financial jobs we we need financial jobs but we don't just need them we need to be generating more smaller businesses um, more entrepreneurship and new <coughs> industries like like solar making sure that that, that works and also reuse and recycling businesses and um, you know, more manufacturing within our in, in the city, a more circular economy where we're, we're keeping the resources going. All of that's really compatible me, with what let, business. Let me pin, pin you down about the business thing because that is a, like a huge topic for for my my two listeners. Um, how much actually? Yeah, how much does the like corporate canary wharf city thing? Because we're always like led to believe that that if they left, London would be over. But do they? In, how does it all work? It is a very big part of our economy. Yeah. It is a lot of our jobs. But more than half of our jobs in London are with small businesses. Yeah. Um, and a lot of those small businesses are sole traders. I mean, um, when, you, when you say half, is that like... In terms of people, is that? I can give you a little background. It's about ten years. I can check. I've got the FSB's report. Excellent. Yeah. I'm stalling so she can get it out. I think. So, so about ten years ago, I did um, I was part of a project in in the Kings Cross area, and there's there was something like two hundred and fifty thousand businesses registered within a five mile radius of Kings Cross Station. So I imagine yeah. half of London small businesses would have been yeah. at yeah. least two hundred and fifty two thousand. That's right. Let's have a look. Just looking at the executive summary. Okay, this is this is what they, I've got the FSB's asks for the mayor. Which I've got lots of those. Do you want to keep talking to me while I flip through this? It's a big and we're back in the room. So we just thumbed through the uh, 15 million page report from the Federation of Small Businesses and discovered it on the front. So front cover of the report says 99.3 percent of nearly a million small uh, businesses in london are small businesses so that's a that's a huge portion and it's more than half the jobs and um, what was the other exciting statistic about living wage oh yeah and then another interesting statistic in the report is that 61 percent of small businesses pay all their employees a living wage and that's interesting because people always assume that small businesses can't pay the living wage so it's going to be a terrible burden on them but actually most of them are already doing it they're not registered as living wage employers but they're, they're paying it anyway because they, they value their employees so in your experience in business and working in co-working places and things like that and yeah. running projects what do, you, what do you think the biggest problems small businesses and freelancers and co-workers and all those micro entrepreneurial independent economic agents what they're called today are um, I mean the, the overwhelming thing that comes across um, from what they say is premises are under threat um, we've got the government doing new planning rules which, which let you convert offices into housing and if you think about the housing market in London which we were just talking about um, it's 
so much more valuable, even if a business is a going concern. If you were to convert it into housing and sell it off, you'd be making a, a huge profit. And that would probably dwarf the profit that you're getting from the business over several years. So it's one of those things where you can't just leave that to the market and you can't just let it be converted. You've got to be preserving the spaces that small businesses need to, to start up in and then to grow into as well. That's when the businesses want to grow, that's that's the point in which they can't find affordable premises. And how, how much, um, this is an off the cuff question here, so sorry. How, how do you, how much su- like financial support of like here's your I mean, I've been victim slush luxury of government financial support and quite often it's been I haven't even I haven't actually needed it I've just been like kidded into thinking I needed it or I, I often feel there's things that a government can do that will support us business growth more than just throwing money at people yeah I, mean, I think I think a lot of things that people do like these like incubator funds and things like that they're very they, they get turned off and on there's a tap that gets turned off yeah, and on and it's, it's not actually a good sustainable way to do things I think actually providing the core things businesses need things like affordable premises and broadband broadband is a massive issue for all the businesses in London um, it's very very poor in most places and it's it's a bureaucratic nightmare trying to get it put into a new premise as well um, that sort of thing if you can just make the conditions right for small businesses protect them from um, the market forces when it comes to premises and things then they can end up generating a lot more for the economy than what what you've put in and I think giving giving grants and things is, is not perhaps the best way although I'm, I'm, I'm up for supporting you know new sectors and things especially if they need to get over a, over a hump so things like the government withdrawing the um, feed-in tariffs from the solar industry just when it was almost at the point yeah, of absolutely. being viable. Um, again, that's like you know, turning the tap off and on. It, it stops you being able to plan. If there's a trickle, and you know it's a trickle, and you know it's going to carry on being a trickle for 20 years, you can live with that. But if it's like a flood and then it gets turned off, that's just that's just in, in, instability. It's no use at all. So I'm going to sell into our last two questions here because we're, we're running low on time. So... Um, Kat Johnson, who's a, a freelancer friend of mine, says, how can city, city officials better support collaborative organisations, including to, but not limited to, co-working spaces, which you kind of just touched mm-hmm. on there, but um, are people co-creating things together? Like, I'd, I'd like to think we're moving towards a more everyone working on a project together thing, rather than like some top-down corporation, one-man yeah. type of thing. So with that, with that really crap question, no, I've just had <laughs> How can city mayors help it happen? I mean, again, you've, you've not got any, any power over this, but you can set an example. You can make the public resources that will help those businesses um, and those kind of projects available. So things like open data are just really, really important. And if, if London... London's got a thing called London Data Store already, where quite a lot of things get, get put up. Um, and there are a number of APIs that are really useful that TFL put out that lots of people make apps out of and things like that. Um, there are many other areas where we might bring together data that's already out there and then make and then put it into a format and make it available. And I think London should have a you know a digital. I've, I've said I want to put a digital um, officer in London, in a deputy mayor, in fact, to be for digital. And I hope they would be doing many more things like that. I mean, the, the digital hustings I went to recently, which I did very well at, incidentally. Like, I, I did used to work at a digital startup, so that's the first thing I was able to say. Was, actually, I know what you're talking about here. Um, but yeah, the the, the the digital hustings there was a lot of a lot of focus on practical things like broadband um, and premises and things like that. But I think also having someone having a specific deputy mayor whose only remit is looking after those industries can make them think a little bit more um, creatively about how we bring together public sector, private sector, uh, voluntary organisations and, and people who want to work together in, in online and offline and in lots of different ways to, to help sort of build that sector up um, and build up the sharing economy more generally. And, and make